This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, this is Betsy Baker, Linda from The Evil Dead, and you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. <laughs> Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today I will be welcoming back Betsy Baker, who played Linda in The Evil Dead, and I can't wait, it's been five years since our last conversation, I decided to have her back on and ask her a bunch of stuff that I didn't get to the first time. I was really nervous the first time. And uh, it's going to be a great conversation. You know, I met her at Dark Delicacies like six months after we did that interview. And so she was so sweet. You know, I had met her briefly at Sister Creature Con to get the interview to happen. But then when I actually had a conversation with her at Dark Delicacies in person, she was just super awesome and so sweet. So it's going to be a great conversation today. And, um, you know, I'll ask about some stuff she did afterwards and you know pick her brain about um the evil dead rising uh that just came out and all of that stuff and uh happy birthday saturday night live it's been 30 it's been 48 years isn't that fucking crazy saturday night live has been around that long it's the longest running show on nbc uh happy birthday snl and many more so yeah, here is my interview with Betsy Baker. My new interview, I should say. Hey Betsy, welcome back. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I am fantastic. Last time we talked, you know, last time I saw you in person was at Dark Delicacies in 2019 and the pandemic hadn't even hit yet. Crazy, eh? It's really crazy. It's really seriously crazy. But we're back in the saddle again. Yes, absolutely. Has has the pandemic overall, though, been an okay experience, or was it frightening? Uh, it wasn't okay, and it wasn't frightening. It was just uh, somewhat life-changing, and somewhat we got through this. You know, there's the old say, what makes you strong? Well, but what doesn't tell you makes you stronger. Exactly. To me, it was more frightening than any zombies, I could tell you. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. That's true. There, there were those definite moments. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yes. So I went back and listened to our previous conversation, and I know which questions not to repeat again. So I want to start by asking, um, have you been back to the cabin since the movie was made? No. No, and the cabin, as I'm sure you're well aware, doesn't exist anymore. Oh, I didn't know. No. Yeah. From what I understand, I have not been there, but from what I understand, it, um, it suffered greatly in a fire. I don't know whether it was nature-related or arson or what, but it's no longer there. Wow. I hope it was nature-related, because if it was arson, oh my God, it's, I, I wouldn't even be able to live with myself if I committed that. I mean, it was a landmark, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's what a lot of people say. Yeah. Do you still have the uh, Michigan State sweater? I do not. I know how to get one, but I do not have that one anymore. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sure somebody passed it off on eBay or something. <laughs> you know, I think, quite frankly, that um, it may not have been mine. They may have purchased it for the movie. Mm. And then, of course, they kept it because of, you know, any pickup shops or whatever they needed to do. And I never saw it again. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, is it true that um, when you were having the makeup uh, r removed, you lost your eyelashes? It is absolutely true. It wasn't the makeup. It was the um, plaster mask that was made prior to a shooting mm -hmm. um, by Tom Sullivan. And, you know, quite frankly, there just wasn't enough, like, Vaseline placed on my eyelids or my eyebrows. And so... You know, when the plaster mask was, when the plaster, the warm plaster, the warm wet plaster was placed on my face, it just grabbed um, my eyelashes. And so when they grabbed that warm 
forming hot plaster that was, you know, hardening rapidly on my face. It just took my eyelashes with me, that with them, and almost my eyelids. But the um. Oh my eyes, God. That must have been both embarrassing and painful. Uh, it was both. It was both. But fortunately, my eyelashes grew back. Yeah. <laughs> did, did, did it take a while? Yeah, I don't know how long it took, but it did. Oh, that is so unfortunate. Um, do you know if Linda's lipstick lips were based on the Joker? No, they were not. They were based on the discussion that uh, Sam Raimi and I had one evening early on in the filming. Mm-hmm. We were trying to create a, um, uh, an over-made-up porcelain baby doll. Mm-hmm. Nice. Now, Sam and Bruce are close friends with the Cohen brothers. Were they around during filming? Not that I recall. No, I do not remember. Did you ever meet them? I do not remember. If I did, I'm really embarrassed, but I do not remember. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 there's also the question of whether they knew each other during that time frame. They may have met after moving out to Los Angeles. Oh, okay. No, no, the answer to that. It's a really good question. Yeah, because they, they did that movie Crime Wave uh, next, which is such a friggin' hilarious movie, but yet they're all embarrassed about it because of the way it came out. Well, they shouldn't be embarrassed about it. We all do things as friends early on. You know, they can't really be, you know, embrace it. But um, you asked a good question, and I, I don't know if I ever met them before. I don't think so. And I also don't know if they knew each other during the shooting of Evil Dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they, they were roommates at a certain point. I know that. Right. But they were not roommates at Michigan State. Okay. Has Del, has uh, Hal Delrick ever done reunions with you all? Oh, yeah. We were actually just all in Germany um, uh, a month ago, and we will see him this Friday at the Burbank uh, Monster Palooza. Oh, cool. Oh, that's right. I forgot you guys were all going to be at Monster Palooza this year. I, uh, I I usually go to Monster Palooza. The last few years since COVID, I haven't been able to go, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, that's so cool. Do, do, do you think that um, this, mo- this movie hindered you from getting cast in, in other things because back then horror was so looked down upon? Teresa Tilly, a.k.a. Sidera York, a.k.a. Shelley the Movie, yeah. has done a lot of open discussions, and we both um, vividly recall that uh, early on in the late 70s, meaning 79 when we were done with the movie, and 80 and 81, we sometimes did not have evil, the evil dead on our resume. First of all, it wasn't finished, and um, second of all, uh, it did back then. It, it did... Um, it did hinder. We were told, I don't know if it's true, but it, we were told that they couldn't send us out on some auditions back in the early 80s when we were still living in the Detroit area where car commercials were made and furniture store commercials were made mm-hmm. and, you know, regional commercials because having the words, the Book of the Dead or the Evil Dead on your resume might not look good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to uh, the people from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and they told me the exact same thing, you know. It was, that movie was so controversial, it was really embarrassing to have that on their resume, you know. So, I, I totally understand that. Yeah. Yeah, so I talked to uh, Teresa a few years ago. She is hilariously funny. I, I didn't know that she did stand-up. Did you ever see her perform? I don't, I never, we laugh about it a lot. I've never seen her do stand-up. Uh, at a comedy store or an improv, um, she she's when we've been together and at conventions and even just uh, um, with friends, she can be pretty funny. But I've never seen her do a routine. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine when the Evil Dead girls get together, they uh, the, the the talks are very body and X rated. <laughs> Well, uh, not often. Sometimes just stupid, you know. Yeah. Sometimes just, mom, just sometimes mom mistakes or wife mistakes or, you know, female adult, you know, stupid stuff. But, uh, um, yeah, we can be pretty funny. Yeah. 
What did you think of Evil Dead Rise? Uh, you know, we uh, both Teresa and I were um, invited to and attended the premiere um, here in Los Angeles, and um, we sat next to each other, and it was very nice. They acknowledged us and had us stand up as, as you know, the old ghosts or whatever the OGs, however you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, from the original Evil Dead. And yet, I did not see most of it because my eyes were covered, and Teresa gives me a hard time about that. So I, to this day, I cannot really say how I feel about it because I missed, I would say, 82% of it. Oh, yeah. I, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, people told me it's great. Uh, I'm a contrarian. I stick to the classics, like the originals, you know, and stuff. But I'll, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. Do so. Do so. I mean, you know, uh, many, to many it was a masterpiece. To some it was, you know, uh, just a, another horror film, many of which are masterpieces. But, yeah, I encourage you to check it out. Mm-hmm. So when I met you at Dark Delicacies, I got that book, The Many Lives of the Evil Dead. I think that that Riki and Sartain did a fantastic job with it. Uh, they, they made me realize things I had never realized before the movie. Like, you know, it was punk rock cinema, and I think that's true. It, it was very subversive and unconventional for its time. It was a far cry from the Romero zombie movies, I can tell you that. And... Also, too, I never realized the political undertones of, of neoliberal individualism and, and Ash being a conservative bigot. <laughs> yeah, you know, it seems that almost everybody, every time somebody, and I know Ron, and, and um, I've met Ron a couple of times, and I've met with Jeff, and, you know, it seems that every time somebody does a, a book or a reading or a writing or, you know, an essay of Evil Dead, I tend to learn more as well, too. So every time I turn around, it's another learning lesson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in your chapter, Being Linda, you mentioned all the questions you get asked constantly, and I was laughing out loud at this one. Did you swear and call names to the director? <laughs> Oh, yeah, we were, we were on such good terms, literally. We, you know, we all lived together. We all worked together 24-7. You know, we did each other's laundry. We, we cleaned each, cleared each other's plates uh, after dinner if someone had to run and go to the set or something. And you reach that comfort level where if you are pissed off or angry at them, even the director, uh, you just yell at them. Yeah. <laughs> and this is absolutely ridiculous. What in the world are you doing? But I didn't say it like that. I, I swore at them, that's for sure. After reading that, though, I thought to myself, maybe that's why Betsy hasn't been in any other Sam Raimi movies. <laughs> oh, no, I have. I have been. And actually, we're seeing him this weekend as well. Uh, I was in, it was a small role, but it was fun. I was in um, uh, All the Great the Powerful. Oh, yeah. I was supposed to be, and I was invited by Sam to be in Evil Dead 2. Uh -huh. However, did shooting schedule and the fact that I was having our first child, we couldn't change either schedule, and so I could not be Linda in Evil Dead 2. Wow. So what, what was the Oz experience like? The Oz experience was great. It was, um, it was far different from the other time that I worked with Sam, which was no money in anybody's pocket, um, mm. you know, takeout dinners sometimes, or... Uh, a, a plate of scrambled eggs for breakfast at 7 a.m. and we shot in a, in a dirty um, cabin mm -hmm. for three months or more. You know, this Oz the Great Powerful was, was filmed at a humongous, enormous uh, new studio outside of Detroit, Michigan. And um, there were sometimes two and three and four hundred on the set or inside these buildings every day and um, there were just rooms rooms and rooms and rooms full of makeup artists and hairstylists and you know we still had some very lovely moments with Sam as the director when he would come over and, and talk to us three ladies of the evil dead and, and share some laughs so it was, it was really delightful uh, Were you in the scene with James Franco and Michelle Williams? I was in a, I was in a few scenes with James Franco and um um with Franco and Williams, and um, yeah, I sat next to Miss Williams at the makeup uh, mirror a few mornings. 
Um, a lot of it was cut. Some of it was cut. Some of their scenes were cut. Some of his scenes were cut. Um, yeah, it was, it was just overall a great experience. Yeah, I never in a million years thought that Sam would do his version of The Wizard of Oz. That was just completely out of left field. I I was really taken by surprise uh, by it. You know, it was, I, I would think more like Tim Burton would do it, you know? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Oh. Now, I know you're not a, a horror fan, but what's your favorite movie of all time? Favorite movie of all time? Oh, gosh. Well, yeah, you're right. On, you're right about that. I'm not a, uh, pardon me, a horror yeah. fan at all. I actually love the sound of music. I oh. love Mary Poppins, which um, is far from the other side of the field than, you know, horror movies. But those are two movies that I really, really love. I love the movie called The Trouble with Angels with Haley Mills. Oh, yeah. I watched a number of times when I was a little girl. And I do not watch films or TVs or documentaries more than once, um, 99.99% of the time. But The Trouble with Angels, I think I've watched no less than eight or nine times. Yeah, I, I love Julie Andrews, too. I, I, I've interviewed her stepdaughter, Jeff Edwards, who's Blake Edwards' daughter and stuff. And, yeah, I'm, I'm a big Sound of Music fan. Um, I've, I've interviewed one of the Von Schropp kids, uh, Nicholas Hammond. And, um, yeah, it's it still holds up, doesn't it? It sure does. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my favorite movie of all time is Back to the Future. I just love the the idea of going back in time and seeing your parents in high school. I've I've always had that fantasy as well. Oh yeah, see now that's where you and I are really different because I do not care for television or film in which you have to pay attention as to if we're in present time. Uh -huh. I just can't do it. I can't do it. Well, it's funny you say that because when I was a kid, you know, I didn't have that kind of attention span to pay attention to details, right? I just loved what was happening on the screen. I loved the performances. It wasn't until I got older that I really had to pay attention to all the tiny details, you know? Yeah, I do know. I do know what you speak. And I pay attention when I watch movies, but I do not... It's hard for me to do this. It's hard for me to understand and comprehend. I totally get it. In 1981, you do a TV movie, Made of Honor, directed by Mel Damsky, who I interviewed a couple of years ago. What a great guy. What was he like to work with? He was a great guy. You're so lucky to have met him. I, I'm so lucky to have worked with him. I ran into him years and years and years later. Actually, we were both at a volunteer Thanksgiving um, uh, <laughs> food bank, and uh, I went up and talked to him, and um, it was it was an enormous experience. I was very young. I was in my early 20s, mid-20s, and um, I was completely unaware and I think overwhelmed at the enormity of people and their talents that were working on that film. There was Mel Damsky, um, Carl Malden, John Malkovich, Rue McClanahan, Ron Silver, John Marley, it was just unbelievable. Alex Harris and Susan Clark were the executive producers, so uh -huh. I saw them every day, and um, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, great cast. Interesting one, too. Carl Malden, Rue McClenahan, Rod Silver, uh, Alexa Kenna, rest in peace. Uh, John Malkovich, did you work with him? Well, he played my fiancé and husband, so yes, I did. Was he intimidating? No, he was very, he wasn't, I can't speak for, for John, but uh, uh, he was very uh, sort of withdrawn and quiet and um, couldn't really read him. And I, I had heard that I, I don't know how comfortable he was at that time doing film and TV. He was as young as I was, and, you know, he was very involved with forming and building up the Seven Wolf Theater in Chicago. So for him to be on a location and maybe, maybe possibly just film two or three pages a day was, was not his, <coughs> pardon me, was not his dream come true. That's pretty much how I've always heard him described. You know, he's hard to read, but once that camera starts rolling, he's that character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, he hmm. was coming from the uh, the Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago, which he helped start. You know. Right. 
you you recently did a couple episodes of the Connors, including an episode directed by Fred Savage. What was he like to work with? Actually, he was lovely to work with. Um, I did three episodes. It was a recurring character named Carla. I worked at the factory, and they have since gone a different road. They don't do many shows at the factory anymore. Um, but he was lovely to work with. It was it was a great experience. I would love to go back to that stage and that set. Um, I don't know what's going on with the Connors, et cetera, et cetera, but, um, but I loved it. I loved it. Uh, did he know who you were? Uh, you know, you never really know. I mean, there are a lot of times I work a day or two or a week or two, and then sometimes it's the very last hour of the day or, you know, it's the very last day that you're on, and they don't come up almost like a whisper. I'm so happy. I'm so honored to have worked with, you know, worked with you, and I, I'm just such a big fan of, of you. And I go, what? Really? What? Yeah. Well, you know, you're all dead. How could we forget? It just, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's always a surprise. I, I can imagine uh, Larry Metcalf and John Goodman were, were a lot of laughs on set. Sorry, you can say it again? I can imagine that uh, Larry Metcalf and John Goodman were a lot of laughs on set. Oh, yeah, Larry Metcalf is a hoot and a holler. I mean, uh, and it was a very comfortable set. And, you know, we shot some of that during the pandemic where there was no live audience. So what they would have us do is, in order for the actors to feel more comfortable and hear and feel, you know, the comedy that they would ask all the actors and all the crew to stay nearby on the set and, um, uh, you know, laugh or, or if you find it funny laugh and be part of the audience so that was that was fun yeah uh, two very talented people and again Lori Metcalf's also from Steppenwolf with uh, Malkovich H- have you done any con since the pandemic besides uh, the one that's upcoming oh yeah we've been doing we went back to cons about a year and a half eh, year and a half ago we did LA Horror Con we did uh, one in San Antonio we just came back from Germany a month ago. Um, we're doing Frightmare in the Falls in two weeks. We're doing Monster Palooza this weekend. We did Cincinnati Horror Hound. So it's been a, it's been a lot of funny games in the last couple of years. Frightmare in the Falls, yeah, my friend uh, Greg Gilbert, who has a podcast up in Canada, he's going to be there. Um, he's going to be assisting uh, Lisa Lengua uh, with her signing and stuff. Um, I heard that's a good one. Uh, since you've been back doing cons, has the vibe been the same, or has it been a different energy because of COVID? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think the I think the vibe has been pretty much the same. I mean, maybe there are some fans and even celebrities that have not attended because of COVID. Mm. Uh, for the first few times, we were, you know, cautious of hugging and kissing and being so close and, you know, um, but maybe with colds and flu and all that, we, we should be all the time. So who knows, you know? Who knows? Yeah. What What's the craziest thing anyone has ever asked you to sign? Oh, uh, there was a tattoo on a guy's thigh, upper thigh, of the three of us ladies of the Evil Dead. Yeah. And he came by and asked us if we would, um, uh, you sign our name underneath picture, which we did. But the next day he went, and then, then the next day he went and had it um, uh, tattooed as well. So somewhere on this planet is a really handsome young man with the three of us on his upper thigh um, with our pictures up there and our signature. Yeah. Uh, um, have you ever signed anything crazier than that, though? Like, a lot of, a lot of horror people tell me that they've signed, you know, various body parts. Yeah, I mean, we've, I've, signed, I've signed tattoos on ankles. I've signed tattoos on the back of the legs. I've signed tattoos, like I said, on thighs. I've signed um, pieces of wood. I've signed um, chainsaws. I've signed bricks that supposedly came from... The Evil Dead, I've designed artwork and cartoons that people have drawn. Um, yeah, each has its own stories to tell, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I know, I, I know this, one, this one actress, she has signed a lot of belly buttons. <laughs> oh, I've never heard of that. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, that's well, that's her um, that's her her specialty thing. She's like, yeah, I won't go lower than that, but I'll sign your belly button. <laughs> oh god, that's pretty funny. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Do you still uh, teach music to kids? You know, I don't anymore. Um, I did it for almost twenty two, twenty three years, and. Um, there was a year and a half of doing it on Zoom, which was really a challenge because, um, as many people know, you can only, uh, uh, only one voice can be heard on Zoom at the time. So we couldn't really sing together as a group. Mm -hmm. That was really challenging for me and the kids. And um, uh, they asked me to come back after the pandemic, but quite frankly, I was getting so busy with acting and in and out of town and working and auditioning. I do a lot of voiceover and foreign film um, dubbing as well that I just had to kind of put up my music conducting stands and my teaching stands. I really miss it. I really, it was really a, a big, a, a great joy. Yeah. So what was it specifically? Did you like teach piano? No, I taught voice. I oh. Taught voice. Oh, okay. To so, like sometimes uh, 1,500, 1,600 kids a week. And I would see class, classes for 30 minutes at a time. Were, were, were you a, a choir singer growing up? I was. I was. I was. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Musically, who did you listen to growing up? Oh, anything I could get and, and get on my AM radio at night. I mean, everything from Herman's Hermit to uh, the Turtles to Association to, Ooh. I don't know, Barry Manilow to, I was not a heavy rock and roller. Uh-huh. Uh, to this day, my friends know that I am not a heavy rock and roller, and that I love um, Todd Rundgren in my college years. Oh, and um, I even loved Barry Manilow. Oh, I, I've seen Todd Rundgren live. He is such a showman. I'm a huge Todd Rundgren fan as well. Yeah, he's brilliant. Oh, just brilliant. And, um, yeah, I, I saw a pretty good concert, and, and, I, and I went to the concert by accident. I was walking by the venue, and I knew the guy in the front, and he said, hey, you want to come in? And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah. And th that was really cool. I got to see a free Todd Rundgren show. <laughs> wow. Yeah, lucky you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so cool. You, you like the, um, the AM pop stuff. So, real quick, we got to play my secret silly game. This is a series of silly slumber party questions. No win or lose, it's just pure fun. And how the game works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me that exact same question and I answer it. And feel free to comment on the answers because they might be funny. Okay. Betsy, are you ticklish? Uh, no. Okay. You ask me? Yes. Are you ticklish? Yes. I, I'm so ticklish that if you tickle me without warning, I might hit you in the groin. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Good. Thanks for the heads up. Yeah. <laughs> is your belly button an innie or an outie? It is an innie. And what is yours? It is also an innie. Okay. Oh, I've been waiting for this one. What color are your toenails painted? Uh, my toenails are currently, they're a dual color. They were painted, um, uh, bright orange, and then I had to kind of like fix a few of them, and I had some orange in my um, medicine cabinet, but clearly it wasn't the same color, so now they kind of look like flames coming out of my toes. Oh. Painted? Um, right now, my toenails are not painted, but last time they were, they were purple lavender. Oh, Okay. When I, saw, when, I saw, when I saw you with my mom at Dark Delicacies, you said to me, I can't believe I'm saying this to a man, but your toenails are beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had like an Easter egg blue, I think, or something like that. A lot of men with toenails, with fingernails and toenails painted. I always compliment them. I think it's, I, I love it. Yeah, same here. Uh, when I was in high school, a lot of people thought that was weird, especially the teachers, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I know, but it's not so weird anymore at all. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, what would you say is your best personality trait? Oh. Uh, I, think, I think I know. What? You're kind. Well, you know what? I was going to say that, but sometimes... Quite frankly, I was going to say that. Here's what I was going to say. I try to be kind. I'm not always kind in thought, word, or deed, but I try to be kind. Mm -hmm. 
that. And what is yours? I have empathy and I have no filter. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I like that you have a filter, but I'll go. I'll, you do have a lot of empathy and I think you are kind as well. Thank you, Betsy. I appreciate that. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Oh, yeah. It's a new one. And I think it's actually post-COVID. Uh-huh. Okay. But uh, I don't know if anybody out there has ever, you know, had, you know, ants in their kitchen. No. Some are ants in their kitchen. But um, I have killed, I have sent them to heaven, a number of them, especially this summer. And for some reason... Hmm. When, as soon as I did it, I had this terrific smell in my kitchen and on my fingers and on my hands. And so I did a, I did a test and I would kill them. I would wash my hands. Uh-huh. I would kill another ant with a finger. I'm sorry. They went to heaven, but I did. <laughs> and it was a terrific smell. And they're actually, I did a little bit of research and they're, I don't even know if I'm saying the word right, but they're pheromones, pheromones that yeah, are, pheromones. that are, um, I will get extended from. It's purged from an ant when there is danger or death, and it warns the other ants that because they can pick up the aroma. And I never, ever, ever smell that until I had COVID um, a year ago in November. And now, even if we step on an ant or an ant accidentally dies in the kitchen sink, uh, it, I can smell it. I, I, it's, oh. That is the most interesting answer I've ever heard. I know, right? Yeah. I know. <laughs> and so it's like, oh, my God. I, so then if you even take paper towel, you don't make direct contact. My fingers don't even make direct contact. But you can, I can smell it throughout the kitchen. Wow. And so, I never could before. So I asked a couple of experts, are their pheromones stronger? Are they eat more? And they said, no, we've never heard of that. It may be a talent that you have. So, eh. Can't always be happy with all the talents we've been given, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For me, um, it's either farts or feet. Oh yeah, those are never kind. Those are never kind to our noses. I'll I'll grant you that. Never, <laughs> never. <laughs> oh, by the way, I wanted to let you know Frank Deet says hi. Oh, hey, what's going on with him? I don't know. I mean, I saw him at a con a year ago and stuff. He's just doing his art and everything. But yeah, but uh, he yeah he, uh, he saw that I was going to be talking to you today, and he he uh, posted on my uh, my Facebook uh, wall a picture of you, him, and Teresa at a con. I was like, oh, that's cute, you know. Yeah, well, when the next time you see him or talk to him, please give him a hug back. I sure will. I'm going to ask him next week if he uh, wants to come on soon. Uh, I've been, we've been kind of hinting at it for a while, so hopefully um, I can get him. Well, Betsy, I thank you so much for coming back on. You're such a gem. I hope to see you again at a con someday. And uh, I hope Monster Palooza and Frightmare on the Falls is going to be a blast. And uh, be safe out there. And the same to you. I hope it will be a blast if you keep trucking on and be who you are and what you are and keep painting your toenails and please do not ask me to kill any ants because I will remember it and I will smell it for the next honor, hour or so after that. So yeah. that. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, dear. Well, there you have it. Betsy Baker, ain't she a sweetheart? I just love her and I adore her. She is so awesome. That is the longest and most awesome answer I have ever heard for the stinky the for the uh, stinky smell that makes you gag answer ever. That is so hilarious. Ants, wow, ants in the kitchen. Never thought of that one. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, "There's no shame in living in the past." Because the present sucks. Later, dudes!